Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Dr Victoria Carr, but I've been told to say Vic, <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. Vic, could you um, introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everybody what you do? I'm Vic, I'm a head teacher of a primary school in the northwest of England and also a British Army Reserve officer. Yeah, now that's interesting. Let's talk about that first, because <laughs> I, you know, I follow you on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I guess uh, my brother's an ex RAF soldier, and uh, I guess my younger years going to watch him—I forget what all the technical language is—but the boot camp and passing out and all those military <laughs> parades, I, I loved it. Um, so tell me about the kind of stuff that you do as a reserve. Um, well, I'm in the intelligence corps, so <laughs> I could tell so you, you can't say and you can't tell me anything. Okay, <laughs> not really, but it's it's really good. So recently in November, I commissioned, which was quite the challenge. Um, anybody who knows anything about the army will know that um, you commission as an officer out of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. Yes, uh, which was quite the challenge, I can tell you, at my ripe old age. Um, but I absolutely loved it. It was brilliant, the best experience, and um, yeah, I learned a lot about myself uh, doing that. Yeah, so. and I've read snippets, I think, in your new book, which we'll talk about, uh, how you were helping younger people, and you were feeling a bit fearful, and you helped them, and all sorts of things. So tell us, um, tell us about some of the things. Are you allowed to tell us about some of the things you were asked to do? Yeah, I mean, the training's fairly standard. So um, anyone in the army gets trained to be an infanteer in the first instance. So you have to learn, first of all, weapon handling drills. So how to strip a weapon and safely um, handle it, you know, load it with a magazine, full magazine and so on. So we do all of mm -hmm. that. Um, and then when we were at Santa, the next stage of that is how to actually use it. So conducting sex, I know, conducting yeah. sec section and um, platoon attacks. Um, wow. And all of that so it's pretty pretty physical stuff so being a head teacher is a breeze then isn't it if you ever have to go to war <laughs> well to be honest with you i didn't notice the difference between the two apart from the fact you wear a uniform and run around in the rain um the lead, <laughs> the lead, the hey, it's leadership like on duty at school isn't it <laughs> right so the leadership skills are pretty similar um being right. an officer to a head teacher so the day job really did help so can i ask would you ever be called up for something or anything how, how does all that work yeah so potentially um you can be deployed you can be um you know actively working uh, on local tasks as well as international tasks depending on on what you do so right, obviously wow. I've, I've got children and i work in a school yes. so some of my colleagues were um working during the pandemic uh, which obviously was really important work but i my work at a school was really important mm -hmm. work so that obviously took precedence but there's no reason why in the summer and then the holidays i can't do short-term taskings which is Great. obviously quite exciting wow fascinating yeah and I, I you know i watch your social posts and i, can, I, I saw you going <laughs> through the kind of new you know the thought process and the struggles and the ups and downs and then the final picture where you graduated so you know congratulations thank you could you tell us a little bit about your school and then I'm going to rewind back to your childhood and stuff like that and we'll do a little back catalogue but give us a little bit of context of your your work in school today. Okay so my school is one of the biggest schools in our area. Um, before I took over as head it had a bit of a rocky few years which meant that my job was um, very easy in a way. I just had to love it back to life and in, inject some enthusiasm and some stability. Mm -hmm. And um, so sometimes that can be really easy to do. If, if that's just your natural disposition, then it, it becomes a pleasurable part of what you do. So although it took a lot of time and a lot of energy, um, just by being myself, we, you know, I've loved it back to life and I absolutely love working there. Uh, we're due in Ofsted any day, please God. Of course, aren't um, we all? <laughs> <laughs> I just wish it would come, I wish they would come, for goodness <laughs> sakes. Um, but yeah, so we're due in Ofsted. I've been there almost four years and, right. um, and I love it, absolutely love it. And uh, gives us uh, how many teachers, how many kids, that type of stuff. Okay, so two slash three form entry. Again, a couple of years before I got there, um, there was a massive kind of exodus of children, about 60 children, which was quite kind of damaging um, for the yeah. school. But we are on the up. We're, we're growing. Even though we're still in, a, in an Ofsted category, we are mm -hmm. growing and growing and growing. And I've got now, well, my staff, I've got 90, 90 plus staff at the moment. Right, um, wow. Big team, big team. Yeah, it's a big old primary, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right, l let's rewind. So, um... I guess we'll pick out bits of your book here because it's uh, 
it's a it's a it's a deep <laughs> book, isn't it? Uh, uh, let, let's start off with the book, and then we'll thread it into some of the questions I've got for you. So, give everyone a synopsis of your book. What's it about? Okay, so a lot of people will tell me things which are very sweet of them, um, like you're inspirational and I don't know how you do and things like that. And it, you know, it makes me feel quite uncomfortable because to me, I'm just fairly bog standard um, single mum. You know, mum have got two teenagers, um, happy to run a school and so on. So I wanted to try and distill what it is I do so that other people can see it's easy to do. It's it's just a it's just a thing that you can all learn to do. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the book um, for Routledge or Routledge. I'm not. I'm not Routledge, yeah. Routledge. Well, I say Routledge. It could be <laughs> yeah. Routledge. Who knows? Let's I find out. <laughs> I think it depends on where you're from, right? Um, yes, probably. Yeah. So, uh, so I wrote the book for them, and it's due out um, later on this year, which is which is exciting for me. Because if you'd have said to me a couple of years ago, you'll write a book and you'll be an army officer, I just I would have. Yeah, you, and we're still on a working title. Last time we caught up. Yeah, so it's called Leading with Love, um, because I guess that kind of summarizes what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of talks about some stuff. I'm trying to sit on my hands because I talk with my hands a lot. So I I've sat on them for long enough now. Um, right. So basically, it talks about some of the experiences I've had as a head, as a human, as a mum, and how I've learned to be a an OK leader, which is, I think, what I am. So, yeah. Right. Well, let, let's unpick. <laughs> let's ask you some tough questions because I'll draw out some of the uh, incredible <laughs> stories inside the book. I think when I was going through it, just even the introduction was like crikey, <laughs> um, <laughs> brilliant stuff. Okay, uh, describe your sixteen-year-old self. I know that's a big question for you already, but let's um, start with that. So my sixteen-year-old self, I was extremely sad. I'd lost a lot of weight. I played netball every night. I played a lot of sports in school. I went to mm -hmm. a grammar school, really, really, really um, high achieving grammar school. Um, and my maths teacher, who happened to be my form teacher, who's a lovely guy called Mr. Robinson, he used to slide half a sandwich to me every day because he could obviously see something was seriously wrong. Yes. And um, I guess he stopped me from um, having serious illness at that time. I wasn't starving yeah. myself. I, I was actually, it was a difficult situation at home. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's my 16 year old self. So I didn't think I'd ever amount to anything. I just thought I needed to try and survive. So I guess, I uh, I, yeah, so uh, that's great to, to, to hear. Um, a question I always ask is in terms of homework, did you hand it in on time or were yeah. you a latecomer? So, you know, given the circumstances to hand it in on time, that's great. No, I was, um, I was one of those quiet children, which I guess it does affect the way I work. Um, I was very quiet, very studious. Nobody would ever have known there was anything going on at home that I, that right. I was sad. I just worked really hard and always had a smile for everyone and kind of hid everything. In fact, um, when I um, talked a little bit in my TED talk about my childhood, as some guys I went to college with who were just adorable, I love them to bits, one of them was Paul Healy, he contacted me and said, Vic, my goodness, when we were at uni, I never knew any of that had happened. You were just always smiling and happy. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably one of my, my big weaknesses, really, just kind of smiling it all the way. And, and, and... Yeah, it's because um, I, I, I've had a very similar story, I think, to you. And I kept a particular story in my life quiet all through my university years and recently spoke about it. And a lot of my old university contacts couldn't believe that you can just shows you you don't really know people. Um, even if you can be best friends, because there's always, you know, something that we can, well, you know, it's context and what what's going on in our heads. But I guess that speaking up is helpful for all of us. So uh, well done to you. Um, if, if I could ask then, so what, you know, in those difficult circumstances, what happens, you know, 16 to 25, you know, university phase, first job, what happened in that part of your life? A lot of luck, actually. I came across a lot of people who wanted to invest in me. And again, it's in the book and, and, and probably I've talked about it a lot, but I feel like I was really lucky and came across a lot of adults who saw some potential and wanted to just invest in me. So I was signposted mm -hmm. to various things. When I was a teenager, I was in the Air Cadets. Um, so I was often doing lots of stuff with them. I was playing sports. Um, I did the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, and then I went to university, and whilst at university, I met two guys who became become my lifelong friends, which they are now, um, Johnny and Richard. And they kind of, Richard's an academic, he's very intelligent, um, existential thinker, and right. he gave me lots of kind of books to read, and he knew I was a reader, so I would just sink myself into these books. And I found myself healing from within, really. I know that sounds mm -hmm. really kind of cliche, but I read these books, and because I was an academic type person, I kind of rationalized it all out in my head and realized that, um, 
you know, there was a different way to live and you could be a different person. That's not to say, um, you know, my confidence uh, increased because it, it really didn't. But um, mm -hmm. I think that's something I'm working on now. But um, mm -hmm. I think definitely my ability to process things and, and um, understand what had happened to me and, and you know, how, how sure. I could help people, um, that happened because of them. So other adults investing in me, I think, was really crucial. And, and when did the teacher conversation start for you? Uh, well, again, this was about survival, really. So I knew that I was on my own and I needed to get a job. I couldn't, I didn't have the luxury of kind of going off traveling or anything like that because I didn't have a backup yeah. plan. Yeah. Um, so whilst I was at university, I did some outdoor work. Um, my, my first degree was in outdoor ed and environmental science. So I did some outdoor work and thought, actually, I quite like kids, you know, I'm pretty good at it. But in the back of my mind, perhaps subconsciously, was this whole thing that when I'd been at primary school, um, and again, it's it, you know, it's boring for people who've heard it in the TED talk, but when I was at primary school, there was a teacher who in, who just in, invested in me and, and said to my family, which was in disarray, you know, this girl's got, got huge potential. And I think that narrative just began a whole um, a direction of travel for me. And I, I guess in the back of my mind, I was always going to be in a job where I cared for other people. I've got four, three younger siblings who I loved to bits. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always looked, kind of cared and, for and nurtured them. So it was all a natural progression when I was at uni and that was it. But do you know what? Um, I applied to be a teacher and I applied to um, join the RAF simultaneously because right. I, lack, I lack the courage to kind of, yes. what was I going to do? I didn't have anyone backing me uh, and I was too weak to back myself. So I ended up being a teacher, but actually I've, I've spent 27 years thinking, I wonder what would have happened if I'd become a pilot in the area, a Chinook pilot. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, all those thousands of kids' lives you've changed. You know, <laughs> well, there is that. <laughs> it's hard to compete with. Um, okay, so uh, first job, roughly, uh, you know, what was your role? You know, class year one teacher, what, no, what did you do? No, all my life. I worked in a middle school in, right. New in Newcastle upon Tyne. Best job okay. ever. Best job, well, apart from this one, best job ever. Um, and I taught year five maths, English and science. And then I was key stage three um, girls PE teacher, which was just epic in this really five, big, big five form entry school in Newcastle and um just had the best time ever did loads right, of residentials great. and stuff so and then my last question then on on the school thing is <laughs> when did the head teacher conversation start uh by pure fluke i think when i was uh a it seems to be head. like that for most people doesn't it okay so tell <laughs> us talk us talk us through what happened worked for a, worked for a nice guy um neil lefeuve he, he was head of a school um he, he you know i was his deputy um worked with him and mm -hmm. yeah, he, he just backed me and said, you know, you, you could do this job and do DMPQH and yeah. So he supported that, that process. And then that was it. And then, <laughs> uh, it. so how many years in headship now? 10, this is my second, my second headship. I know, can't you tell? <laughs> Look at this face. <laughs> no, you could face. not tell. Wow, amazing. I, I have huge admiration for head teachers. Um, okay, let's, let's get into the the, the nitty gritty of the book. So it's okay. still in draft. Uh, you know, we got, we could talk about the editorial process because we're both authors, I suppose. So there's all that headache. Uh, how, how did you start the process? Let's, let's talk about the logistical side of things first, rather than the content. Uh, somebody recommended that I do it and um, I didn't know where to begin. And so I kind of again fell into it and I thought I haven't got a clue. What, what could I, what could I talk about that people would be interested to hear? And yeah, I basically did a talk last January, not the one gone, but the one before for some students at Hope University and they wanted to know about my career. Mm -hmm. So I said, listen, you're going to be bored. Everyone's bored to death of Zoom. So I'll, I'll just give you some some in, in my long years. And I kind of summarize it into about 12 points, which I then tweeted later on. And then someone said to me, what you should do is expand on those and make them into a book. And so each of those points became a kind of blog sized chunk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the that's the book, really. <laughs> it's nothing. And now you've thrashed it out. <laughs> so what is word count 60,000 words are we on? Uh, 100,000. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like a lot. I know. But um, yeah, so. So what's the current book challenge? We'll get into the content. But what what's the um, where are you currently at with the editing process? So it's gone. It's gone to the printers. It's gone today. That's it. God, that's quick. We were only chatting the other <laughs> week about it. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's um, 
so it went to them in January and I've had to I had to ask them to delay it slightly because my daughter's not 18 until November and she wanted to give permission to be named in the book so you're right okay so that kind of delayed the process a little but actually it's fine because the book was written you know before. so it will be printed for mid to late November yeah 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 great so yeah. we've got a title we've got a cover yet yeah <laughs> All right. Okay. God, lots of things have happened since we last yeah. spoke a couple of weeks ago. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't hang about. Right. No. So give me a, a kind of top to bottom teaser of what someone would learn from, and you have got loads to share, Vic, uh, Vic so don't be shy about this. What will they learn from your experiences in life uh, throughout the book? I guess from a personal circumstance, but maybe as a teacher, I suppose, also in a mother I think um, that none of us are perfect, no matter what you see on the surface, none of us are perfect, that we've all got our skeletons in the closet and our yeah, kind of we have. Uh, regrets and um, heartaches and difficulties and we're all the same, we're all just human, trying to navigate this crazy thing that we call life and um, if people stopped trying to compare themselves to others and just became the best version of themselves. I know that, again, that sounds cliche, but genuinely, it's how I live my life. It's what I've learned in all the 47 years I've been alive. And through all the things I've survived, I think definitely that. Um, and also some, some little tips, like how I... People often say, how do you manage to do this and this? Just time-saving tips and... Yeah. Right, so give us, give us two or three. <laughs> Go on. Let's put you on the spot. Uh, okay, so... <laughs> So people say, how do you manage to exercise and do everything else? So um, I live 10 kilometers or six miles in old money from my school. So anybody who runs will know that 10 Ks are 10 Ks and you can run 10 K. Um, so I might run to school or, um, you know, in the army we call it tabbing. So I might go with weight and on I go. So I can- Yeah, kind of kill great. And then I thought to add to that, um, I could listen to after listen to music. Music's like my life. And um, what I decided to do was start to listen to audiobooks, which again is an anathema for me because I love actual um, tangible books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Books. Me too. Yeah. Um, so, but I got into audiobooks uh, last year, and you know I've listened to some incredible um, stories on the way to work and back. And so, yeah, multitasking. How do I? Help well, I know people? a good audiobook called Just Great Teaching. I can send you a copy if you want to, <laughs> if you want to you. fail your ten k run. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's just that's right just what's happen. your email strategy how do you delete your emails what's your what's your workload tip there um read them and either action them or write write down in my diary so i often have a list in my diary my diary is an absolute riot i'm old school i do it all in paper I oh put a, right I, use, I know right all right i do it all in pencil and i put a line through the things i've done so i prioritize everything in that diary and if it's in the right. diary it gets done and if so not so fingers crossed you don't lose delete. that diary i know honestly it's like <laughs> Fingers yeah. crossed. Um, so we've got tips in there. We've got lots of kind of deep stories. Uh, we're both parents. Uh, talk about some kind of parent uh, situations that you've shared in the book. <laughs> so one of the things I share was that when my son was at secondary school, my son's dyslexic. He's an absolutely gorgeous boy. Um, he's 18 and a half now, and, he, and he's a you know, real man's man. But when he was at school, he, he's very tall. Yeah, and uh, he so he was in year eight, and he was walking through school, and was at the back of a bunch of boys who were pushing and shoving some year sevens. And I got a call from the head of year, long suffering, who said, "Yeah, your son's been involved in this. He's on detention." So I could have kind of said, "No, he didn't do that. I'm, I'm going to come in and you know read the right act to the school," which I would never do, and I don't advocate doing that either, by the way. And so instead, mm -hmm. I, I I talked to my son and I said, "You know what this is? This is tough love. You're on detention. That's tough." Um, and he said, what? I didn't do anything. I said, no, but you, you're with a group of people who did. So if you were an adult and everyone was pushing and shoving someone outside a pub and someone got injured, you'd be kind of part of that and you'd be in trouble, like big trouble with the police. So let this be a lesson, a life lesson that um, if you don't want to be involved in, in, in being labeled like those other people, then just don't, don't be with them, don't hang out with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he was aggrieved at that at the start and then said, actually, f fair point. So that's, that's just one of the many Yeah, one of thousands of shenanigans. <laughs> Oh, my boy's going into uh, secondary school in September, so you got any good tips? It's really weird uh, going through school as a parent, even though you're a teacher. It's such a, a really fascinating side of the education system, mm. and that bite in your lips really tough, isn't it? It's really hard. So any tips? I would, um. uh, transition <laughs> tips, I'd be more than welcome to hear them. 
So take a deep breath. I think parenting is this massive um, roller coaster ride. You think when you before you have a child, you think I'm get, I was very arrogant. I thought, yes, my child will never eat crisps on the carpet. Um, you know. <laughs> And then you yeah. think, yeah, these like carpet picnic yeah. things go on. And I think, you know Chris, what, you just... Yeah. We're dealing with uh, <laughs> sofa surf watching Chris <laughs> moments. And now it's in the bed. So we need to move away from that. But it's probably going to get worse now as he gets towards 18. Um, okay. Yeah, they are a blessing. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, let's move to mental health strategies. So we both and I, you and I both had, a, you know, some trauma in our life, I suppose. And... Mm. You talk about it in the book, and I think we all, you know, like you said, we're not perfect, and we all have our demons and skeletons, and we all have our moments of a bit, of, you know, where we lack a bit of confidence. So I guess the question from a mental health perspective is, what kind of strategies do you use to kind of raise your confidence or recognise when you're having a bad day? Oh, and and what heck. would you what would you say to others? I know it's a big question, but any um, kind of resources or strategies you draw upon. Yeah, I think um, nowadays self-talk, and again, the flipping neck, I'm not an expert in this. What I do is work really hard on it with myself. So I can only say to you that um, I, I don't feel like I'm ever going to be finished with that. I feel like I never feel like I'm good enough. And that's something I can only say now at 47. Mm -hmm. and, and in the last couple of years, I've reached the point where I could say that. And part of that is obviously to do with all that stuff that goes on in your childhood. Part of it's to do with relationships that you have as an adult that go wrong. And you tell yourself the wrong thing. You make it about you and you don't make it about the fact that it's two or three people involved in a circumstance or a situation that sometimes those things are beyond your control. So mm -hmm. I think what I'm really good at now is talking myself through how my physical response is. So my, if, if my physical response is to run away and kind of close myself in to protect myself, then I, I might do that instantaneously. And then I really say to myself, okay, you, you're responding like this because of this. What you now need to do is do this. And you know you felt like this before and therefore you can name these feelings and their anxiety and, it, and it's okay to feel like that but what you now mm. must do is this and it's kind of just i get a narrative in my head and once you've mm. got your narrative mm -hmm. it, it's kind of just like this loop that goes through your mind when you have those responses and i don't think we'll ever get away from the response but hopefully my speed to um respond and my ability to respond will become yeah the, the more i've learned about memory you can uh, that reward loop or the kind of how trauma might be uh I guess activated for want of a better word it's a it's a it's a bit like that cognitive behavior therapy without me yeah. being an expert in it but you yeah. just have to learn and adapt I, I I guess the next thing I'd like to ask is how much of that blurs into you know into your role as a head teacher you know that confidence side I, I know through my life in teaching I learned a lot of personal things I could use from my life as a teacher you know public speaking in front of a thousand kids in assembly <laughs> <laughs> you know panicking for your life but then rising above that and then using it in your personal life um how's that been for you well i feel like um one of the easiest things that i did when i became ahead was just kind of align all parts of myself and think it's too much stress to try and be different people for different people so yeah. be better to just kind of live a life of integrity and where i make decisions based on you know ethical and moral um, beliefs of my own and, and that way no matter what happens I know that I'm always in alignment and again that's to do with mental health I don't have this kind of cognitive dissonance where I'm thinking oh, oh you know what should I say I think right what is it it's always about the children so if it's about the children this is a decision and everybody knows that all my senior team know it my teachers know it and in fact a mm -hmm. lot of our parents know it as well and um, so even when I'm have challenging conversations with people they know that it comes from a place of this is about this is about the best for the child, the best for the children. Yeah, it's for, interesting because I was on a chat with someone uh, overseas just before we came online, and we're having a chat about. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but the total opposite of that, the the decisions being made by someone above and remotely, was not in the interests of children. Sadly, more in the interests of bullying and cutting back and redundancies. But that, that's the that's the landscape we live in, isn't it, sadly, in all industries, not just in teaching. I do uh, feel Vic like um, for, t for teachers, though, that is that is the thing as a head teacher. That's kind of the thing that you're there's being pushed down on us. So we're kind of pushing against that from above and yeah. you know, trying to trying to protect people below. So in between is us, which is why I think so many heads leave, because they're being squished by that narrative from above. But below, they see the need and, and, and what the majority of people, certainly the majority of heads I know, want to do is provide for the need rather than kind of 
do that yeah, do the, that do the, that horrible stuff <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm just drawing a little doodle actually it's such a fascinating summary uh, and an accurate summary of the pressures that our, our school leaders are under isn't it that, that you've got people in front of you with livelihoods and careers and children with lack of alternative provision and a mm -hmm. diminishing budget and you've got all this nonsense policy making decisions being <laughs> spouted up on high yesterday. i think I yeah said it on Twitter. <laughs> well i i put out a tweet yesterday and i do it once a year you know what are the biggest education problems right now and oh, i just yeah, get inundated <laughs> with tweet and then i turn it into a blog and yeah. i'm going to compare last year's to this year particularly with the pandemic i yeah. suspect all the response are the same but what i've noticed is the sen provisions become tougher tougher for people mm -hmm. and I think with the mental health crisis that we've you know had through the pandemic it's only going to get worse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right let me switch let me come back to the kind of practicalities of being ahead mm -hmm. um, now you'll know workload drives all as all mad um, what do you think is the biggest pressure for teachers well there's not one I know that but um, you know today pandemic you know, as we emerge now what, what are the things that drive your teachers mad the most I think um, I think there are a few, if I'm honest with you. So in my school, if I'm honest with you, I think it's, um, you know, we're ready for Ofsted to come in and visit us. So they want to, my staff want to share and showcase mm -hmm. the work they've done. And they know they've only got a limited amount of time to do that. So they, they gather bits and pieces, you know, and it's important to them to do that. So I think in the back of that and being conscious all the time that someone's going to come and ask them as a subject leader about this, that and the other, they're, they're gathering that evidence for that conversation rather than just knowing that it happens. I yeah. know it happens. I know the children are doing it because I see it every day. But if you've only got a few minutes to kind of celebrate this with Ofsted because you want them to write something positive about you, then automatically you are self um, motivated to gather that stuff. So you've got yes. marking it and wanting to assess children's work and share it with them and, and drive the learning forward. You've got planning, and again, that's that's it's the it's the it's our it's the teaching equivalent of a high stakes summer exam, isn't it? That um, right. you've got to perform on the day, and if you forget the answer. Uh, your intent is not clear and it's, if it's not on paper and I can't see it or I can't hear you say it then it's uh, requires improvement isn't it I, exactly and I think the vulnerability in a school like ours with its history you know is that it, it, th there's a chance that you know it's had two two RI judgments one before I got there um, yeah. a terrible two years following that and then I took over and, and we managed to drag it back up to RI which was great absolutely brilliant you know we've got a good for leadership and an RI for overall but you know that's that's three years ago and that's you know we've had two years of pandemic in between so this idea that we'll have enough information about the yeah, curriculum yeah it's tough it's definitely tough isn't know? it and uh yeah. when you see you'll know what i think about Ofsted, but you when you see all the data <laughs> play out play it out online and how schools in your category can often fall by the sword or not uh, and that vulnerability it's a uh, it can that can significantly drive everyone's workload can't it yeah and children's behavior you know the support networks for children, you know, I have a full-time Senka who's amazing, by the way, and a full-time learning support mentor. They're just incredible people. And they spend all of their time scrapping it out, trying to get funding and, and challenging decisions about funding and, and trying to support parents who are struggling with this idea that their, their, their child has additional needs and yeah. having all the tricky conversations with staff around um, strategies that could be tried and staff really being quite anxious about, am I doing the best for these children? And then those children affecting the learning of other children. You can appreciate for teachers this is the everyday this is the reality mm. of what they do never mind the fact that they've just spent two years you know trying to do that and also teach online simultaneously for pupils who may not have been in or also if they were ill trying to do that so you know i think it's quite complex and, uh vic can i ask you know in terms you know the context you know you work in the world so for people listen who are not familiar it's in kind of the northwest of england near liverpool um <laughs> your area you know what are local head teachers telling you same messages yeah yeah so my, my good friend um who's been a head teacher now about 30 years he says um he's never ever known it in all the years he's never known it. he's ready to retire obviously and and he said he's never ever known it to, to be this way to be this bad um you, you know he, he said to me i'm so sorry for you. you've got another 10 years left and I, I couldn't i couldn't do it i don't know how you stay so positive and i think a lot of people are leaving you know i see it on twitter a lot of the kind mm -hmm. of um the networks that we have are, yeah. are quite quite fed up and 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 you know let's let's change the mood a little bit um 
uh, what what have been some of the successes that your teaching staff and your school have done through this difficult period? Well, stand by because um, there's a company called Commander Joe's. Yes, I know and Commander Joe's. Do you, they're great. Do you know Mike? They're so cool. Really, really good. Yeah, company. yeah, they're very good. Yeah. So my school, and it will be launched on the sixth, uh, the week beginning the sixth of June. My school have worked with Mike um, to create some brand new materials, so some missions for every year group, oh, um, curriculum based, and so on. Um, so that's really exciting. So yeah, they're very that. good. Yeah. Um, we've also done lots of things to help other schools. So um, I've done lots of kind of um, Zoom meetings to help new head teachers who might have um, taken over school that has finance um, issues because we we right. had that. We, our school was yeah. half a million in debt when when I took over. So help them with that. Um, so yeah, one one of the things is the Commander Joe's, but we've done all kinds of other really cool stuff. So. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, um, I look forward to those resources coming out and seeing the social stuff. Right, I'm going to um, bring things to a close, I suppose, but I'm going to just, I like to do it, you're old enough like me, you can remember Timmy Mallet, where you get loads of, I've, I've written lots of notes, and I'm going to just fire loads of questions at you, and you can't pause or hesitate, and I, oh, flipping I, heck. Okay. I can't bang you on the head, but... Um, let, let's just start off with some easy ones and I'll try and get a bit tricky as we go through. Right. So let's start easy. What is on your head teacher desk today? What's your project? Uh, flipping it. My project is my most recent master's dissertation, which is causing me a headache. And it's your third MA, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. Listen to that, folks. <laughs> um, right. What physical book are you reading at the moment? Uh, I've got it here. It's called um, Future Leadership. Yeah, it's called Future Leadership. Okay, great. What's the Audible book? Uh, Jacob Morgan. Uh, here Jacob you go. Morgan. Here you go. I'll show you. Okay, let's see. You'll have to say it out aloud for listeners on, on the podcast. Okay, but the, the people future, watch it. Future Leaders. The future Leader, Jacob Morgan. And Scram is the audio book, which is about the um, helicopters in um, the Falklands. Great. And what's the what's the tune that gets you to the 10k finishing line when you're exhausted? What's that bit of music that picks you up? Oh my word! I've got um, I've got I've got a shuffle thing. So um, it's is it you... BGS or anything <laughs> classic like that? <laughs> no. Do you know who it is at the moment? It's um, King Kings of Leon. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Kings of Leon, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, finish this sentence. If I were Education Secretary of State, I would um, get rid of Ofsted and Sats. There you go. Uh, what would be your piece of advice for a teacher wanting to do an MA? Um, compartmentalise your time really effectively and don't challenge yourself with anything too difficult for your dissertation. Make it about something that you do every day. There you go. Now, uh, last night, I'm sure you did. Let me just check. Did you watch the Queen's Jubilee on the telly last night? Uh, I watched it a little bit this it? morning when I was ironing at five o'clock. Now, the, the, the guys all took their hats off and they did a military headdress off or something. There's two words they use and to put it, and I thought it was brilliant. Could you give me a military drill for everyone? Uh, we okay. don't have to follow it, but just how would you do it as a sergeant major and which one's your favourite? Uh, a military drill? What, what do you mean? Like, uh, like present of... arms or <laughs> one that we're not familiar with? Um, I would, the one that makes me laugh the most is, um, make safe. Right. And what so, do you do with that? What is that one? So what make do you safe, actually do? <laughs> make safe is a full unload and then a full load of your weapon system. All oh, right. Make safe. Make <laughs> well, just, safe. Right. And it's a two word and then you have to do probably five or six physical movements or something ridiculous. Uh, a lot, a lot. So as I say, it's a, a full unload and then a full load. <laughs> Right, brilliant. Uh, if I came to the Wirral and we had 24 hours together, what would we do? Where would we go? What would we eat? Uh, what would be the local sites to see? Okay, so we'd, I, I would take you, Ross, on the ferry across the Mersey. We'd go to Liverpool. Oh, yes, brilliant. We would see the museums and go around the docks, the Albert Dock, which is just lovely. Make, yeah. and have a look at the liver buildings. We would go up to, I think it's the... 30, 30 odd, 13th odd floor. There's a lovely restaurant and like a bar up there. I can't remember what it's called, but somebody, right. will, ta somebody will definitely tell you on this. Yes. And we'd have, look, have a look out over the skyline of Liverpool. We'd have a nice few cocktails and so on. Maybe go to the gin and the whiskey bar. And then right. the next day we'd have breakfast at the... No um, teaching. <laughs> no, 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 no. Refreshment rooms, breakfast. Run into my school. Meet all of my lovely kids. With the dog. Meet the dog. Meet all the lovely kids and staff. And... Um, then I might treat you to an ice cream at Park Gate, which is right. That's other side it. Of let's the let's sort out a date. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Right. Give me uh, your TED Talk summary in thirty seconds. 
Um, the power of what we say is absolutely vital. Every single word you say to someone can make a difference to their lives. There you go, even quicker. Uh, your netball position? Goalkeeper, goal defence. Okay. Um, how you, you mentioned earlier that you had a series of luck. Now, whether it was accidental or you had a certain method, have you got any strategies or was it just a series of just life circumstances? I think um, I'm always nice to people. Well, there you go. That, that's a tip in itself, <laughs> isn't it? Because some people don't like being nice. Um, yeah. how, how do I... Um, a, a new teacher who's thinking, oh, outdoor education, science, sounds like something I'd like to get into. What would be your advice? University of Cumbria does a brilliant course. I'm one of their um, little helpers, add-on helpers up there. And they, some of their students come down and work in our school. It's an absolutely brilliant place. It's located in Ambleside in the Lake District. What better place to learn oh, about beautiful. the outdoors? Yeah, brilliant. Uh, top tip for a teacher teaching a dyslexic child. Uh, if you have a dyslexia-friendly classroom, then your classroom is friendly for all children. Don't tell there them they're go. stupid. Don't make them feel stupid. Be patient. Oh, Amen. Uh, let's see. Biggest career achievement to date? Um, helping a, a young army soldier years ago before he was even in the army um, to achieve his maths GCSE and English GCSE. He had nothing and then I taught him for a year. He's my massive success story. Daniel right, Mars, great. big shout out. <laughs> okay, well done. Uh, now, dream job, wacky career. If you weren't in the army or head teacher, what would it be? I'd be a landscape photographer teaching people how to take photos on the Isle of Skye or the Isle of Arran in the west coast of Scotland. Oh, the favourite place is fantastic. Um, <laughs> who, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Oh, my word. Well, I would say Censored Head, but he won't come on because he wants to keep his um, yes. uh, thing Yes, anonymity, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd say Kirsty Stubbs. Firstly, she's absolutely gorgeous and stunning. Kirsty Stubbs. Like, yeah, okay. she's so fab. And like me, she's got lots of tattoos. Um, when you said interesting fact earlier on, I was like, interesting fact, what's interesting about me? I don't know. I, I don't know. I couldn't think of anything. I was thinking... I've been right, sure. give us a tattoo. What have you got? I've got loads. I've got an anchor. I've got... Um, a big angel, a guardian angel. Um, I've got a butterfly, big butterfly. Yeah. Right, and you got another <laughs> one in the pipeline. I'm uh, thinking about it. Thinking about it. They're, I see. Yeah. I've I've managed to avoid them my whole life, but I've got a secret <laughs> fetish for them. And I think if I ended up getting one, it'd That's be like it. my gar my gardener. Did it. I've re since I've moved to Yorkshire, I've got addicted to gardening, and I can't stop buying plants. <laughs> I think if I got a tattoo, I'd end up covering my arms. Uh, so I'm trying to avoid it. Uh, okay, where can listeners read your book, find out more about you, connect with you on Twitter or Insta? What would they do? Okay, so um, Twitter, it's happyhead74. Yeah, happyhead74. Um, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. I think that's just my name. Yeah. Um, I'm on Instagram, but I can't remember what it is. I think it's Vixter Simple right. 7. We'll dig it out. Yeah. And, and what's the what's the flavour on the channel? So I get your professional side on LinkedIn, and I, I get that on Twitter also, but we get a mixture of the, the rants and the honesty <laughs> as well. What Do we get something different on Instagram? Well, mainly photos, mainly landscape <laughs> photos. Um, oh, well, there you go. There's, yeah. a, there's a new career calling, isn't there? <laughs> well, if there was money in it, if I could pay my mortgage, I might be tempted. But no. Hey, there's money in everything I, I've come to learn in my life. There's, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a way. Uh, okay, so I'm going to catch up with Kirsty at some point if I can. Uh, my last so, question, Vic, is what would you hope to be your legacy? I would like people to say when I'm a very old lady and I, and I pop my clogs that... Um, I enhance their lives, that their lives are made better because I was in it. There you go. What a lovely way to finish. And the book, uh, we've got a publication date? Uh, November. But I, I guess it'll be on social media okay. between now and then. Let's say the end of November, and then that's when everyone can grab a title. So we'll give that a plug too. Right. Okay. Vic, it's been great to catch up with you again. I can't believe how quickly your book has moved on <laughs> since we last spoke. So I suspect if I catch up in a couple of weeks, you'll have got a fourth <laughs> MA or something. No, I've got crazy. to get this one done. Yeah, right. If I'm in the world, I'll give you a shout and we can go for that ice cream. Absolutely. Right. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. And all the amazing work that you do and all the inspiring uh, lives that you're changing. Keep it up. Thank you. Bye for now.